Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to Highlands Fellowship. It's great to have all of you with us today, where our mission is to help people experience life with Jesus. And I pray that as we've spent some time preparing our hearts by, by worshiping and praising God, and, and we just have our hearts in this posture in such a way that we can receive the word from the Lord that he has for us today. I pray that that's the case, and I hope that's where you are. Uh, if you're here at one of our campuses, we are so glad that you're here online, on TV. Welcome to each of you, and I want you to know that we care about you, and we love you, and we want to walk on this journey in your life with Jesus Christ together with you. If you're here today, and you would say, you know what, I'm just kind of checking church out. I don't really know a whole lot about this church thing. I, I don't know what to think of it. I've heard about Jesus, but I don't really know who he is. I don't really know what he's done and why all these people would come and learn about him and, and worship him. It just all seems so crazy to me. Listen, if that's you, I want you to know that you are at the right place and we are so glad that you're here. Just keep on coming, keep asking those questions. And I believe that through the people and through the teaching of God's word, you will come to know Jesus in a very real way and it will be in a way that will absolutely change your life forever. Today, we're continuing our series we're calling Highs and Lows, where we've been looking at different people in the Bible that God uses to absolutely change the world. And what we're doing is we're looking at the highs and lows of their lives so that we can learn how to handle and how not to handle the highs and lows that come because we know that we're gonna be experiencing some similar things in our lives as well. And what we've been doing and what we're gonna see is that we see that God is faithful in every circumstance and that his plans are always, always good. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the life of Joseph. His story is found in the Old Testament book of Genesis in the Bible in chapters 37 through 50. And I would encourage you to read that this week to get even more from the teachings that you'll hear about today. And this is a story of a remarkable journey filled with so many highs and lows, trials and triumphs, and through it all, a steadfast faith in God. Joseph's life serves as a powerful testimony of how God's providence and his faithfulness work through the ups and downs of life. And so let's look at the story of Joseph and his journey, learn from his experiences, and see how this story can apply to our lives as well. Joseph was actually, actually the 11th son of Jacob. And his father loved him more than any of his other sons, which caused jealousy among his brothers, as you would imagine. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. That's where we get the coat of many colors that you may have heard about Joseph. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph was also a dreamer, and he had these two dreams that would further fuel his brother's jealousy. The first dream it was that his shaft of grain stood upright while his brother's shafts gathered around and then bowed down to it. The second dream, the sun and the moon uh, and 11 stars bowed down to him. And when Joseph shared these dreams with his family, it, it only deepened his brother's hatred. So Joseph's brothers, their jealousy actually led them to take drastic action. They had initially planned to kill him, but ultimately they decided to sell him into slavery. So Genesis chapter 37 verses 23 through 24 says this, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. And the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. And later what they did is they sold him to a caravan of Ishmaelites heading toward Egypt. And so in Egypt, Joseph was then sold to Potiphar, and Potiphar was an official of Pharaoh. And despite his circumstances, Joseph thrived. He thrived in every circumstance because the Lord was with him. Genesis 39 verses 2 and 3 says, The Lord was with Joseph, so he, he prospered. 
And, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. And when his Egyptian master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Potiphar then entrusted him with everything. He entrusted everything he had to Joseph's care. And Joseph managed his household very, very well. However, Potiphar's wife falsely accused Joseph of trying to seduce her, leading to his imprisonment. Joseph's time in prison obviously was another low point, yet he continued to experience God's favor. The warden put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners because the Lord was with him and gave him success in whatever he did. He found favor. While in prison, Joseph interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker. His interpretation came true, and despite his plea for help, the cupbearer actually forgot about Joseph once he was restored to his position. Two full years later, two full years had passed when Joseph's breakthrough came. It came when Pharaoh had two disturbing dreams that none of his advisors could interpret. So the cupbearer at that point remembered Joseph, and Joseph was brought before Pharaoh, and with God's help, he interpreted the dreams, predicting seven years of abundance followed by seven years of severe famine. And so impressed by Joseph's wisdom, Pharaoh uh, appointed him as the second in command over all of Egypt. So during the famine, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy some grain, not recognizing him. And after several interactions, including testing their integrity and willingness to sacrifice for each other, Joseph revealed his identity. In Genesis chapter 45, verses 4 and 5, it describes this emotional moment. It says this, Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one who you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So Joseph forgave his brothers, understanding that God used their actions for something so much greater. Joseph brought his entire family to Egypt where they were provided for during this famine. A Pharaoh actually gave them the best part of the land and they prospered. Joseph continued to manage Egypt's resources wisely, ensuring that the nation survived the famine. Joseph's final words to his brothers before his death were filled with with much faith and foresight. He reassured them of God's promises and his faithfulness to their forefathers In Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, where it says this, Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so as you see, there are so many highs and lows that Joseph went through in his life. And it really reminds me of a time when when I was younger, we had a few friends who were always up for something, all right? They were always up for some adventure, and we'd like to hike, and we'd play ball, we'd swim, we'd ride around. Really, we were always into something. But we went through this phase where we would go caving. Uh, We would go caving. So let me just go ahead and tell you that I hate, like, dark, tight spaces, but I went anyway. Well, one time when we were crawling around in this cave, I stepped in the wrong place, and when I did, my foot slipped, and I hit my shin on a sharp rock so hard that I couldn't speak. And to be honest with you, it's probably a good thing that I couldn't speak at that time, right? Because of what I might have said. But I was rolling around, holding my shin, thinking that I'd broken it, and it hurt so bad, and it kept hurting. It hurt so bad. I I felt like it was gonna it was gonna hurt forever. It was a lifetime before I got any relief. But I just kept thinking to myself in that moment, when is the pain going to stop? When is the pain going to stop? Now, My shin was not broken, but I do still have a big scar on my right shin to this day. But but as I've thought about that story, I've asked the question, when is the pain going to stop a number of times and for a variety of reasons throughout my life? I've asked that question whenever a relationship or a friendship has come to an end. When will the pain stop? I've asked that question during seasons of anxiety and depression and frustration and confusion. When will the pain stop? 
I've asked that question when I've made poor decisions that end up hurting my family in some way. When will the pain stop? That's a question that many of you may be asking right now. It's a question that I believe Joseph probably asked a lot in his life as well. In fact, Joseph grew up a, a talented, gifted young man, and, and God had given him a promise that he was going to grow up to, to do some special things and, and to do something significant, and he would. Joseph would eventually grow up to provide critical leadership to an entire nation during a massive global crisis. But first, his life would have to take a painful 13-year detour. He would be beaten and thrown into a well by his brothers. He'd be sold as a slave in Egypt. He would be falsely accused of doing something that he didn't do. He would be thrown into prison. He would, he would do some people a favor, and then they would forget about him in prison for another two full years. And when most people would have thrown in the towel and, and given in to their own bitterness, Joseph actually stays strong. And as a result, he is one of the very few leaders who, who we read about in the Bible who actually finishes well. And I don't know if you know this or not, but, but only about 20% of the leaders in the Bible finish in a respectable way. And Joseph is one of them. And what makes this story that much more impressive is that he probably went through more pain than perhaps anybody besides Jesus. Yet Joseph still stayed humble. Joseph has a servant's heart. And I've just got so much respect for this guy. There's so much that we can learn from him. You see, pain often brings progress into our lives in unexpected ways. And that's what Joseph's story teaches us. And that's why we're studying it. Now, pain is never fun, of course. I would never wish pain on, on anyone. We never enjoy pain, yet some of the greatest gains in our lives come through seasons of intense pain. With that said, I think it's important to point out that, that pain is never permanent, all right? And here's the, here's the illusion of pain. When you're in the middle of it, when you're in the middle of pain, it feels like it's never, ever going to stop. It's never going to end. But that's simply not true. When I was rolling around in that dark, cold, damp cave that day, I thought, this is never going to stop. But eventually it did. The pain eventually subsided. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that pain is something that is short-lived, but its effects and the impact that it has on our lives, it brings about, it brings about this refining process that is long-lasting. And that's really, really important for us to remember. Here's what I've come to learn over, over the years, and especially over the last four to five years, is that there are always going to be times of uncertainty. But those same circumstances will not last. I mean, how many times have we heard terms like, these are unprecedented times, and we've never ever seen anything like this before, and life will never be the same. And I want to acknowledge that yes, We've all been through a whole lot. We've all been through a massive crisis. We've all been through a number of different things. But that doesn't mean that we haven't seen things like this before, the same things that we're experiencing today. But maybe it, it's not in our lifetime. Maybe it's in the not-so-distant past. And, and here's what we need to know. If we remember God's faithfulness in the past, we will be confident in the future. If we remember God's faithfulness in the past, we will be confident in the future. As followers of Jesus who have walked through, are in, or who are going to go through pain in our lives, we need to remember that. But we also need to be godly examples to others who are watching us and how we walk through life. As Christ's followers, we want to be responsible. You know, we want to be wise. We want to be sensible people. We want Jesus to be our focus, and, and we seek the will of God in our life and in our church. We're going to refuse to give in to the hopelessness and the fear that happens in our world. 
We need to remember Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Listen, God is faithful. He was faithful yesterday. He is faithful today. And he will be faithful on into the future. I promise you, he is going to redeem those painful times and situations that you're walking through right now. He will. So I've given you a quick summary of Joseph's life, but what I want to do is I want to draw a few things out of his story kind of after, after he had gone through so much of the pain in his life and he was at a point where he was ready to grow and to move on into the future. And, and he gets called into Pharaoh's court because Pharaoh has he's had this dream that nobody could interpret. And Joseph comes in and says, Hey, I, I can interpret the dream. Uh, your dream means that you know, you're going to experience seven years of incredible prosperity followed by seven years of famine, severe famine. So you better prepare for it. You better get yourself going. And, and Joseph is able to put his gifts on display for Pharaoh. So look with me at Genesis chapter 41, verses 37 through 40. It says this, Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, says, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of these dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a higher rank than yours. And what I love about this is that it's so clear to Pharaoh, so clear, who, who for all we know was not a believer in God, but from the outside looking in, he could see. I mean, he could see the Spirit of God so clearly in Joseph's life. And right now, as much as ever before, our world needs to see Jesus in us. A calm heart, a clear mind, not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Well, in Genesis chapter 41, verses 41 through 43, it says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. It's like, you look at it, wow, that is absolutely amazing. Talk about a dramatic turn of events. He goes from being in a prison cell to being in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Verse 42, then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in a fine linen, in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down or, or make way. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. This new chapter of Joseph's life looked dramatically different from where he had been. And what I love is that he didn't let any of this go to his head. I mean, he's rolling around in Pharaoh's limo and everybody's you know, bowing down to him. And, and here's the thing. Joseph's character had, had, been, it had been forged by the fire of his pain. So he, he could handle it now. And it says this in Genesis chapter 41, verses 51 and 52. Joseph named his older son Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. And right now, what, what we just read, this is the beginning of recovery in Joseph's life. He's saying, God, help me forget all of my troubles. But did you also notice that he said, and forget my father's family? So there is, there is some pain still in Joseph's heart. And I don't blame him. I, I understand why there would be. So when he says, forget all my troubles, he's not saying that he, he will literally forget all the troubles, but he's saying that where he is now, that God's faithfulness has actually overshadowed all of the pain that he's gone through in his life. What Joseph is doing is he's remembering the faithfulness of God in the past so that he will be confident as he walks into the future. He is acknowledging the faithfulness of God, but there's still some recovery 
that needs to happen in his life. Well, seven years of plenty, they come and they go. And by verse 53, they are now on to the seven years of famine. And it says in Genesis chapter 41, verses 55, 56, eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you to do. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. Uh, Chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. When Jacob, Joseph's dad, heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? I heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. And then as we jump down to verse 7, we we see that they had made their way to Egypt. And so chapter 42, verse 7 says, Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. And when I think about that, I just think like, my goodness, what would it have been like? Years had gone by. And, and, And he sees them, maybe a little older, maybe a little grayer, but he recognizes them. But he pretends to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. And I probably would have too. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We've come to buy some food. Like long before the show, The Undercover Boss, you had this going on. Now, Joseph is the boss and his brothers are the ones that are in need. How is Joseph going to respond to them? Well, there's this part of me that thinks, you know what? This would be a sweet time for some revenge. It really would. Well, yeah, let me give you a little bag of food and maybe I'll spit in it before I hand it over to you, right? But Joseph has come to the decision, or he has a decision to make here, I guess. And and we see that there's this, this kind of back and forth between Joseph and his brothers in the middle part of chapter 42. But, but I want to point out to you in Genesis chapter 42, verse 23, it says this. Of course, they didn't know that Joseph understood them for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now that's interesting. I want you to think about this for just a second. Joseph has been in this foreign country, in this foreign land for so long, for so many years, that he's actually learned a different language. He's spoken a different language. They didn't even realize that he could understand them. Uh, And that just shows you that not only was there like this emotional gap that was between them, But very literally, there was a cultural gap that was between them as well. Look at verse 24. Now he turned away from them and he began to weep. And that verse right there is a pivotal moment in Joseph's life. When he regained his composure, he spoke to them again. Joseph's raw emotion and real tears here reveal the beginning of recovery in his life. This reveals that Joseph had gone through some severe trauma And I love how he regains his composure and decides to go back in to speak to them again. Joseph's character really does shine through here. He's going going to serve his brothers even though they have caused him so much pain and so much heartache. I think that there are some of you who are here today and you need to acknowledge that what you've experienced in life is trauma. And maybe not all of us have experienced trauma in our own situations, but some definitely have. And and, and there are a number of ways that we can choose to respond to that trauma. Uh, We see it played out every day, don't we? I mean, we can get angry, we can become fearful, we can give in to fear and paranoia, and those are all just, just coping mechanisms to deal with trauma. You see, trauma isn't just about what gets taken from you. Trauma is about what it leaves with you as well. Has your situation or your crisis left something with you? That's why we need to address it. That's why we need to, to work, out, uh, work, work it out and work through it. That way, we can be healthier when we come out of the other side of it. It can actually strengthen us. You see, Joseph could have become a very a very, very angry, bitter, and cynical old man because of the pain that they had caused him. A lot of other people had had done that with, with far less painful circumstances happening to them, but Joseph didn't. He didn't. 
He worked through his grief in a healthy way, and as a result, God produced incredible fruit in and through his life and his leadership. God was faithful to Joseph. God was faithful to Joseph by being with him through all of the highs and lows of his life. And one of the reasons that I believe God blessed Joseph's life so much was because of his incredible ability to forgive. He could forgive. I mean, he was able to forgive things in his life that many of us would consider to be unforgivable. But Joseph was able to keep keep focused on, on a bigger picture, a higher purpose, rather than getting caught up in all the junk and all of the pain and all of the hurt that these people had caused in his life. I, I just want to give you three practical application points that we can learn from Joseph's life, and all of them are about forgiveness. The first one is this. Forgive as God forgives you. Forgive as God's forgive, given you. So the Bible teaches that that we should forgive others just as God has forgiven us. And this seems so simple, doesn't it? Until someone has wronged us or someone that we love, then we tend to think about it a little differently. But this principle is rooted in passages like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, which says, be kind and be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. This means extending the same grace and the same mercy that we have received from God to other people. The second point of application is this. It's this, it's this idea of unlimited forgiveness. This is a hard one. Unlimited forgiveness. Jesus emphasized the importance of forgiving without limits. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, when Peter asked Jesus how many times he he should forgive someone who sinned against him, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. This principle highlights that our forgiveness should not be restricted or should not be counted. And then the last application point that I want to give you today is that we need to strive for reconciliation and restoration. Forgiveness is not just about letting go of grudges, but also about seeking reconciliation and restoring relationships. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, he says, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. This principle underscores the importance of mending broken relationships as part of the process of forgiveness. And so I want to ask you this. Are you forgiving others as God has forgiven you? Are you offering unlimited forgiveness or are you putting limits on how many times you'll forgive someone? Are you looking to reconcile and restore the relationships that are damaged in your life? Joseph could have easily become bitter, angry, and held a grudge against so many people in his life, but he was willing to forgive numerous offenses and bring reconciliation to those relationships. Joseph was a great example of navigating life's highs and lows as he held tightly to God. And he maintained his commitment to God through so many difficult circumstances. But God was faithful. And his plan was so good. It just took some time for it to play out in Joseph's life to where where he could actually see it. And that may be the case in our lives as well. That may be the case in your life. But we will remain faithful to follow Jesus and do what he's taught us to do. And because of that, we will be able to walk confidently into the future. Let's pray together today. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. And when we look at the story of Joseph, it is so challenging because there were people who did some things to him that we would look at and go, I don't know how anybody could forgive. But God, we are taught in your word that we should forgive. 
not just one offense, not just two, but we should continue to forgive. And it's really unlimited how many times. It's not that we don't learn from our situations, but we still forgive. And it's not always about the other person, but it's about giving these things over to you so that we can move confidently into the future without the baggage that we've been holding on to for so, so long. God, I'm thankful for stories like Joseph's in the Bible that we can learn from, that we can see how you were faithful with him every step of the way. Although when he was walking through it, he may not have seen it all the time, but you were. Sometimes in our lives, we don't always see your faithfulness. And it's when we come out on the other side that we continue to see it and we see how good your plan is and how faithful you've been. But help us to recognize it before it happens. Because you've been faithful in the past, we can trust you with our today. Because you're faithful in the past and you've been faithful today, we can trust you on into the future. God, as we read in your word, and as we see from our experiences and also the experiences of people that we know, we can see as we follow after you and we're obedient to your word and we continue to be faithful, you will be there with us and you will be faithful to us and your plan is good. Help us to have that confidence as we continue to move into the future. God, you're a good God. We love you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, Amen.